Did you go to school? Nebraska. I didn't know there was a Nebraska school. <laughs> and it's the right time. This one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are you taking off your last one? No. Nope. Yep. I think they've got to wait for him. Sonrisa. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Pedro Rodriguez de Almeida. I am the head of infrastructure and urban development industries at the World Economic Forum, and I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the World Economic Forum to this press conference on the launch of our Strategic Infrastructure Initiative Report on uh, Operations and Maintenance. 
World Economic Forum has been working in this topic for the past three years, and uh, we built uh, a knowledge series on strategic infrastructure covering the, um, the three building blocks of uh, project origination, project delivery, and now operations and maintenance. Particularly the volume that we are launching today uh, has uh, a lot to do with what goes on uh, in the world. Existing infrastructure stock, uh, in fact, can be optimized for its uh, usability. It's not always wise to build new if existing infrastructure can be refurbished and be put to operation uh, with benefits to the end users. And that substantially decreases the amount of uh, new money that has to be injected either by governments or the private sector. So it, it just makes uh, business sense. It makes uh, sense uh, in, the, in, in terms of society to look at this type of operation and maintenance strategies on how you can optimize the existing utilization of assets. Particularly the report that you have uh, on your desks, uh, it's uh, titled Steps to Operate and Maintain Infrastructure Effectively and Efficiently. Uh, it's a report that uh, is uh, done in collaboration with the Boston Consulting Group and very much uh, follows uh, a practic uh, an approach with practical guidance to governments on how they can look at these uh, challenges, but also as opportunities to look at their existing infrastructure and also to balance the need to invest in greenfield, so in new infrastructure, or on the contrary, with the infrastructure that is already in place that can be uh, upgraded, refurbished, or simply changed in terms of how you operate and service it uh, on, a, on a daily basis. The report very much uh, brings together um, simple ideas that can be uh, properly uh, digested, uh, not only for specialists, but also for government officials uh, and specialists in the public administration. It's not meant to be a detailed uh, technical compendium of uh, what are the, all the requirements, all the details of operation and maintenance, but rather to focus on uh, a number of strategies. And these strategies, they can either be implementation strategies, like maximize the utilization of an asset or enhance quality for users, to name two, or they can be enablement strategies, for example, to ensure funding, to build capabilities, or to reform governance. The report itself has a number of case studies that were collected across the world. It covers mainly what we call economic infrastructure, but it has also a number of uh, examples on social infrastructure, on the best practices on how operation and maintenance can be, uh, in, can be included in social infrastructure. So without uh, further uh, ado on the report itself, you will have, you see the, the press release and you have it with you. I would like to introduce the panel. We have Minister Roy of the Panama Canal Affairs on my extreme uh, left. We have Rashad Kaldani, Executive Vice President of Emerging Markets, Caisse de Puy Epargne of Quebec in Canada. We have Lee McIntyre, Executive Chairman of CH2M Hill, and myself, Pedro Rodriguez Almeida from the World Economic Forum. I would like to ask Minister Roy to provide some uh, initial remarks. He is, of course, um, familiar with the work that we produce. We have prepared a um, specific case study on the Panama Canal, and uh, I would very much uh, invite you, Minister Roy, to share your insights. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, introducing this uh, very fine technical report. It's been the, the product of many, many hours of work by many institutions. I think it's going to be a very fantastic uh, piece of uh, technical uh, report for uh, all the people involved in the process of maintenance. Uh, just for the um, Panama Canal, I just want to mention briefly, thank you, that maintenance is really one of our main jobs every day. This is a process that has been going on since 1914 when this uh, waterway started. And I want to mention a couple of things so you have a, an idea of the value of maintenance. The process of maintenance at the canal is very, very structured. It's not like we're going to go ahead and, and if something broke, we're going to do maintenance on it. No, this is a process 
It's all preventive maintenance. Absolutely everything is preventive maintenance with a very rigorous uh, progress and a re very rigorous uh, project. Now, for example, some, many people don't understand that when the canal, they forget, they're not aware that when the canal was built, the technique of reinforced concrete was just starting in the world. And also, electricity, AC electricity, was just starting as a worldwide business. As a matter of fact, we had a very little company that this was their first big job, was called General Electric. Mm -hmm. They did the first, they did the, the Panama Canal was their first big job, and uh, they, they did a very good job, certainly, for many years. Now, the concrete that was used in the canal was not even 2,500 PSI strong. And it has, it has lasted 100 years. And the reason is that we have been doing maintenance on it for a long time. Now the new concretes are specified very expensively to have all kinds of mixes, more cement, uh, more additives, uh, lot of, lots of things. But our co original concrete Really, if you look at it, it was a very poor concrete, but very well maintained. So that's why I stress the fact that Panama Canal is mainly a maintenance operation. Now, also, we had the miter gates. You see the canal does not have, the new canal will have rolling gates that, that will do like this. But the ones we have are called miter gates because they close at an angle. This has several reasons for it in, in those days. Uh, it'll, it'll apply the pressure from the water and close them very well. Uh, so it has a lot of uh, technical uh, detail on why they did it that way. Now we're doing that differently for some other technical reasons. I'm not going to get into that, but the, what I want to stress is that those gates lasted 85 years on rack and pinion um, levers. If you went there, the the gear was, uh, I don't know, maybe from that wall to you. That was the diameter. It was a huge um, wheel and with a very little one that was only acted upon by a 40 horsepower motor, electric motor. And it was an incredible thing that lasted for 85 years, never broke. It was due, due to uh, excessive and incredible maintenance. Now they have been changed for uh, hydraulic uh, systems. So I just want to close my, my, my remarks saying that maintenance is key, and I hope this report will give uh, an insight of all the work that we have done, and we can also learn a lot from the other uh, participants in the forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Roy. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Rashad Kaldani to give uh, also his uh, insights, particularly uh, from uh, an investor side and as a large pension fund that is interested in, uh, in infrastructure. Indeed, Pedro. Thank you. I think this is a very timely report because as I've traveled around the region over the last four or five months, I hear from country to country the huge needs uh, for further investments in infrastructure. And as rightly pointed out, there's a lot of benefits to be acquired from new infrastructure, but also from maintaining existing infrastructure. But that, this report focuses on the latter, and I'd like to bring up why from an investor such as CDPQ, which has $200 billion under uh, management, and is looking for this asset class infrastructure, why this is so important. We actually like to buy existing assets because they're relatively low risk, they provide current income, mm -hmm. but we are long-term investors, so we look for assets that last 10, 20, 30 years. And obviously there, the whole issue of operations and maintenance is critical. So we have already $8 billion in this class of infrastructure. We are now actively looking to expand on that in the emerging markets. And I think this report is very timely in bringing out some 
very practical steps to keep the value up and, and to attract long-term investors such as uh, CDPQ and, and other institutional investors. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Rashad. Lee, I would like to have also your uh, insights on, uh, particularly uh, as um, you are the executive chairman of a large uh, design engineering construction project management company, very close also to uh, what uh, the canal is going to be today. Well, <coughs> Minister Roy's comments on the canal kind of uh, sum it up. If you think about if they had not had maintenance, the design life was probably 20, 30 years, so they would have to build three or four canals. Think of the, the expenditure uh, base there. So that kind of sums up, uh, you know, the value of it. This report is excellent. Uh, if there's anything more exciting than infrastructure, it's O&M. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> the, um, the, the, we've learned at this conference that long-term financing and local currencies is the issue for Latin America trillion dollar shortfall at least. Well, if you, le you learn from this report that actually a big bulk of that, part of that shortfall could be taken care of by sustainability, resource, asset allocation, and O&M uh, and existing projects. To me, what operation and maintenance is, is it's resource management, it's asset management, and it's data. Uh, for example, there's a lot of projects um, around the world now that are redoing pipelines, gas pipelines, because people have forgotten where they're built. They were built 60 years ago. They've held up well on their own for 60 years, but now they're starting to leak. During that time, since we lost the data, don't have the data, houses have built, been built over the gas lines. So this created a whole new issue. If the projects had been, had a plan for asset management and resource management, uh, a lot of cost could have been eliminated. So uh, this report is just excellent. Thank you, Lee. Um, I would like uh, now to open the press conference for the journalists uh, that are here in the room. I would like you to please clearly identify yourself and to stand up and say your name and also your affiliation. Also, please make one question at a time. Uh, make it clear. And uh, also, if you have a particular preference in the panel to answer that question, also indicate, and I will moderate that uh, answer together with the panelists. Please take the mic. Mariana Palacios, de Capital. Mariana Palacios from Capital Financiero. The question is for Mr. Roy. We would like to know the cost of maintenance for the Panama Metro system, if you have estimates already. The maintenance of the metro, which we shall inaugurate on Saturday, it's our first line here in Panama. The total cost, and we will talk first about total cost, the operational cost and maintenance, power, energy, administrative costs. It'll be about $50 million. By law, when we drafted the law for the metro, the first thing we did was to establish a provision stating that at least 20% of revenue shall be allocated to maintenance. Therefore, that contract for the maintenance work will run, I have to uh, check the uh, exact final numbers, because we have several maintenance contracts, but the largest one is the contract for uh, the uh, actual moving equipment, the trains, the equipment, etc. That contract is probably, it's probably around $9 million. The others are smaller contracts uh, for cleaning, uh, exterminator costs, just smaller contracts for the rest of the operation. But the largest one is for the moving equipment. We have very new sophisticated equipment, and we shall provide good maintenance for it. Thank you. I have a question for Minister Roy. This is Enric Brines from Oxford Business Group. Uh, Minister Roy, line three. There are two options on the table. Uh, monorail and light train, uh, like line one and two. Uh, there, are all, there are also two opinions, an engineering opinion and a financial opinion. Uh, under your view, what is the best option for line three? A monorail 
or light train. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting question because uh, we're going to go ahead with the monorail for line three. And there are many uh, specific reasons for this. The monorail has the capacity to go up a steeper slope. Okay? We have two problems. On the, the monorail is going to the west, that means going over the Panama Canal. So we need to build a new bridge, and then we need to go and negotiate all the hills. that We, we have some hills on the other side, and if we did not use a monorail, we would have had to uh, build lots of tunnels, okay? So when we made the calculations in the um, total uh, cost and the benefits, the monorail uh, came on top. There are new monorails because some uh, people think in, in their mind that the, the monorails are like a Disney World thing. Uh, yeah, they do. As a matter of fact, I did too. Uh, at the beginning, but no, no such a thing. There are new monorails with uh, uh, lots of uh, capacity, and uh, they have been uh, used for some years now in, in, in Tokyo and in other places. Now they built one in, uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, so, well, we had the problem of the hills, and also we had the problem that when we we're going to put the monorail station on top of the metro station so we can have a vertical transfer. Okay, so now when the, when the monorail goes out from Albrook, uh, if you know Panama, there, where it is in Albrook, uh, we have a, an airport that we have to take care of. So the monorail cannot go, the train or whatever we would have put there cannot start slowly going up because then you meet the approximation cone of the airport. So we had to go low at the beginning and then suddenly rise up and the only um, equipment that could do that fast enough was the, the monorail. So those were the two reasons that we use a monorail instead of a light train. Please, take a mic. Good afternoon, Mr. Well, I'm William Espinosa, AIP Business Magazine. Uh, what's the status of the Panama Canal project right now and the final investment? Line one, no, the Panama Canal. <laughs> Changing subjects. Point 20. Okay, there are several contracts. Let me explain this. There's a contract for dredging, many contracts for dredging. The dredging has been done by our big companies, uh, dredgers in the world, uh, Boscalis, uh, Jan de Nul, uh, uh, International uh, Dredging, Dredging International, uh, etc. So that's one part of the thing is the uh, dredging. The other ones are excavations in, in dry land. Okay, so there are other companies that have that. Then we have the Pacific Access Channel, which is another contract. And then we have the big contract, which is the LOX contract, okay? Now, the LOX contract, which is the one that has been in the news, it is a $3.2 billion contract. And on your question of uh, financing, um, one of the issues that we've been discussing here are the advances that we gave to the contractor. First of all, the first 600 million of advances, it is written in the contract. So there is nothing uh, to change there. It's 600 million. And what is that money for? It's for all the equipment that they had to buy at the beginning. They had to buy immense equipment to manufacture concrete. Okay? That's one of them. Uh, trucks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of this money is for, for equipment, maybe 400 or close to 500 million of the 600 million was used for uh, all the equipment that was needed. And then the rest was used for what is called mobilization. Uh, they have to s install all these things, etc. Now, on top of the 600, we have given them 184 more. So that's $784 million. That's the one that we have advanced up to now. And uh, the discussion that we had before with the contractors was that 
uh, contractors felt that they had rights to claim uh, X number of dollars for this, for that, for that, okay? Our only position, and we maintain it, and it was the position that stick, that stuck, is the we, you should go, we told them, you should go through the procedure. And the procedure is clearly spelled in the contract. They wanted to do a deal outside of the contract and say, okay, let's make a deal for X million. And we said, zero. No, we, we don't go for that. So if you want to do, if you want to get money, you sure can get money if you convince the dispute adjudication board to give you that money or then later the, uh, uh, arb in arbitration. So um, at the end of about you know, two, three months of hack, going back and forth, you all read about it in the newspapers. Um, I think that we finally convinced the contractors that first of all, we were acting in good faith and that we were not trying to shortchange them. And uh, you know, that the way to go was by the uh, rules and that if they think that they have the right and that they are right on what they are asking for, then they'll, they'll be able to get it there. And then we made some other uh, deal here, which is very key. And this was the, 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 the deal maker for the, for the uh, finish of the conflict, it was that the uh, insurance company uh, made available through uh, backing some European banks, uh, $400 million, which is re very unusual. I have spoken to many people in the industry, in the uh, insurance industry, and practically the uh, uh, Zurich America, that's the name of the company, Zurich America has done something uh, for us very good, and uh, in the international scene, uh, kind of unusual, because they practically uh, took the risk already for something that hasn't happened. I mean, that, that bond is in case the contractor uh, uh, goes broke and the job start, stops. But uh, they went ahead and helped us making available this money for the contractors now so they can finish the job. So uh, on top of that, then we gave them $100 million more and they put $100 million of their own. So we, uh, we got $600 million of fresh money uh, last week. So... Um, uh, they, they have enough money already to uh, go ahead. And we, we still owe them a lot, so uh, I think there is about 1.6 billion dollars at this moment, 1.5 billion dollars at this moment, that will be disbursed during the, during the next uh, year and a half or so until the job is finished on supposedly December 31st, 2015. We'll probably, depending on X or Y, if they. Uh, comply with that, then we can give them a little extension to February 2016, but that will be the, the longest. And they want to do it really for 215, because they can, uh, um, they get other, other, other um, awards within the, the deals that we have made. The deal with me, it's, it's called the, uh, the, the, the final MOU, and the MOU is being translated into Spanish because uh, lots of people here in Panama are requesting to have a copy of the MOU. So um, uh, they have been, I think it should be translated but at this moment already. Uh, it will be made available to the public maybe, maybe next week or so. Thank you. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Adolfo Berrios from La Estrella. My question is for Minister Roe. The administrator of the canal, Mr. Jorge Quijano, already announced that Evergreen withdrew one of their services from the canal. Uh, what services were withdrawn and is there another shipping company that is announcing changes? The situation is the following. It's very simple. Due to the fact that the canal is not ready, the expansion, the new expansion is not ready, we have lost business that we had up to this point. And uh, they are leaving, and they're leaving for the Suez Canal. And what's the reason behind this? We are seeing more that there are two things influencing this, uh, the price of oil, 
which is the number one variable in the operating costs for a vessel, uh, fuel costs for many. The other is also that the vessels that are too large, that at this moment cannot pass through the Panama Canal, they're the most efficient ones. So uh, therefore, they have great efficiency when you divide the quantity of oil used by the number of containers. You have to divide the cost by 4,000 some containers. But if you divide it by the Suez Canal, it might be in 9,000, 14,000 maximum. And there's some new vessels that were never expected to traverse through Panama that have approximately 18,000 containers. So these vessels have great efficiency the latest technology, engine technology, and what they're doing now, because they cannot use the Panama Canal, is that they're using the Suez Canal. Now, what's going on with this? Well, it's taking them longer uh, for merchandise to arrive to its owners, and I'm talking Walmart, Home Depot, all these companies that use the shipping lines for their supply. Uh, for example, a trip from China they go all around and use the Suez Canal. They traverse the entire Mediterranean, the Atlantic. That takes them about 12 days more than using the Panama Canal. But the fuel cost is so favorable. And uh, because the shipping lines are not the ones that are paying for the different in costs, the ones that are bearing the costs are the Walmart, Home Depot uh, companies that are paying for inventory uh, that they will have in their warehouses for 12 more days. And shipping companies said, well, this is the way it is. There's no other way. And it's a phenomenon that we're seeing, and it, we hope it's temporary until the canal is finished. But this is why it's so critical to finish the work soon. Back. Good afternoon, Blanca Berseril with Bloomberg Financial, also for, Mi for Minister Roy. Do you have a data on how much is being lost uh, because the Panama Canal is not ready? Uh, do you know how much uh, you know, companies are losing? F well, the truth is uh, I am not, uh, I'm not a data banker. There is such a number, yes, of course. It's less than what people think it is. But uh, please, uh, don't quote me on this number. And But I think it's around $50 million, but we shall confirm it with the Panama Canal officials so they can provide us the exact number. It's not a huge number, but it's not a small amount either. So we really do not want to lose business to the Suez Canal. And uh, we will uh, try to speed up the process as much as possible. We have two large competitors, the U.S. Land Bridge and the Suez Canal. And what do we mean by Land Bridge? Uh, the vessel comes from China, arrives at the U.S. West Coast, L.A. and Long Beach ports. Then they transfer it to the railways, or they use trucks, and they are transported this way to New York. This land bridge is a little bit quicker than using the Panama Canal and then going upward. It's about five days quicker, but it's more expensive. So that's why we take a lot of business away from that route. When we you know, really began to position the canal as a commercial company, now they are also making their own investments. And uh, things are becoming more equal. But those are our great competitors. But right now, the Suez Canal journey is the one that's taking away business. A land bridge in the US is used mostly for uh, time sensitive cargo. Uh, a time sensitive freight, um, an iPad shipment, you know, that has to arrive to its market quickly. So that freight uses the US land bridge. Um, other goods, you know, are able to uh, take longer and they can use the Panama Canal without problem. Take into account that we have a representative of a big pension fund. These are the guys that really have the capability to mobilize capital 
into physical assets. So don't miss the opportunity to ask Rashad Kaldani also questions about that. And, and again, uh, nothing of this happens. And uh, although this type of um, assets like the expansion of Panama Canal don't come that often, the private sector that makes this happen is here and they're also involved in a number of other projects. So don't uh, miss the opportunity to, to ask as well how this happens and uh, what they are doing to make these uh, projects very successful. I'm enjoying Mr. Uh, Minister Roy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, lear I'm learning a lot. Fascinating story. <laughs> Please, microphone here. Hi, Tiffany Grabsky, SNL Financial. Um, question for anyone, really, um, because we've been talking a lot um, in Latin America, specifically here in Panama, being the hub of the Americas, about integration of infrastructure in all of Latin America. Um, so I wanted to know a bit uh, your opinion of what the opportunities are for integration in Latin America, what's being missed, and what maybe um, we'll, we'll see shortly. Prashant, do you want to, to take that one? Well, in, in every region of the world, integration provides huge benefits. And I think that's the case in, in Latin America, as it is, for instance, in Africa, that I also know well, and, and Asia, two regions that we're focusing on a lot. Here, there's tremendous, you see it uh, in, the, in the logistics sector, uh, the huge advantages to what Panama is doing is going to benefit all the countries in, in, the, in the Caribbean region. Lots of ports are coming up because of what Panama is doing here. You see it also in the, in the gas sector, for instance, uh, a lot more uh, trading, a lot more pipelines being discussed that go across countries. Uh, I think the energy sector as a whole, which is something we're looking at a lot, it, it lends itself to, to a lot of integration. So, yes, I do think there's tremendous scope in this region. You know, there's integrated projects uh, already um, in South America. So, uh, integration lends itself to a place with dense population like Europe. Uh, there's a lot of integrated infrastructure, uh, energy, data management, transportation, rail, everything in Europe is the population is uh, at least 20 times more dense than South America or North America. Uh, so it does lend itself a little bit more when the countries uh, are heavy, heavily populated. But there's examples all the time of, of integration. We have time for one last question. There's one in the back. There's one. Please here. My name is Patricia Moore with American Airlines Nexus Magazine. I'm a question for Ghost for Mr. McIntyre, and it is about the integration of NAFTA, which we know that is now turning 20 years. Um, even though they don't have that dense population, what do you think about the results? Well, I'm a big NAFTA fan. Of course, I'm a big free trade f a fan, so I, I think NAFTA has been a, um, a huge success um, for uh, uh, but it's seen friction. If you see the Keystone Pipeline um, issue that's coming from Canada to build a pipeline across the U.S., so you see friction, you see politics, you things, see things enter. Uh, but I think it's been a, a, a very powerful economic block, uh, especially in energy now, with all three countries in NAFTA uh, being energy rich. Um, if we get our act together, uh, it could be very... Um, Trading blocks uh, are being formed all over the world right now. I mean, there's three treaties that are being discussed out there that would include two-thirds of the countries in the world if they are approved. Uh, they, all, they include the United States in all three of those trading blocks. So I, I think uh, NAFTA was a good move. Uh, not everybody likes NAFTA, um, but as far as my, as a business person, it's been uh, quite successful and has more, more potential if we can get out of our own way. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roy, Rashad Kaldani, and Lee McIntyre for the press conference. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.